In this lecture, we're going to explore sculpture. This is the first three-dimensional form of art that we're looking at. And as we look at sculpture, you should have already noticed from your chapter that we tend to look at it in four ways. First, we look at its dimensionality, then the method of execution, meaning how it was created, then we can look at its composition, how its parts are arranged, and then there are other factors. First, let's look at dimensionality. There are three main types of dimensionality when we're looking at sculpture. The first is what's called full round. This is a sculpture that is freestanding and fully three-dimensional. Basically, think of it this way. You can fully walk around the work and see it different from every angle. The creators of these sculptures also must keep in mind the practicalities of engineering and gravity. So if you look at the image here, this is made by Bernini, and it is Apollo and Daphne, 1622-25, to and it is made from marble. Marble, very, very heavy material. So with this work that is very tall, Bernini also had to remember that it had to stand upright. So that's why if you look at the base of it, you have a very thick base. This is more for the stability of the work, otherwise it would topple over. Again, you can see the dimensionality of it, and this is full round. You can see it here from this angle. What Bernini is showing in this sculpture is a moment captured from the, the story about Apollo and Daphne. What happened was you have the, the god Cupid, who was Venus's son, and Apollo was kind of making fun of him, the god Apollo. Kind of like, oh, your arrows are so cute, look at that. And so what Cupid does is he actually shoots Apollo with an arrow so that the next person Apollo sees he falls madly in love with. Well, the next person he saw was Daphne. Then what Cupid did was he took another arrow and he shot Daphne with it so that she hated and was terrified of the next person she saw, which of course was Apollo. So you have Apollo obsessed with Daphne. Daphne wants nothing to do with him. She's just trying to get away. And Apollo continues to chase her and chase her. Finally, as she's trying to flee from him, she begs her father, also another god, to help her, to help her get away from him. And so what he does is he actually turns her into a tree. And this is that moment right as she's fleeing from him where she's turning into a tree. If you look in this image here, you can see her fingers are becoming leaves and branches. And then I'll go back to these slides so you can see the base, her feet, and her legs are becoming the trunk of the tree. And you can also see it from this angle. Even in her hair, the hair is becoming the leaves of a tree. And you can see that all captured within this marble work. Here's another example of a full round sculpture. This is by Richard Serra, and it's called The Matter of Time. It was created in 2005, and it's made of steel, and it's located in the uh, Guggenheim Museum in Bilboa, Spain. Now, this work is also a full round. You can fully walk around it, and you can see it in different dimensions, different um, from each angle. Now, this work, you can't see it all at once. It's a massive, massive work, as you can see by the human figure in the background. What Sarah was doing in this work was he was actually making people more aware of the space. As you walk through this, the spaces get smaller and smaller till you almost have to squeeze through. And that was done very intentionally by Sarah. Next, when we're talking about dimensionality, is we have what's called relief sculptures. Relief sculptures can only be viewed from one side. Why? Because they are projecting from a background, meaning they are attached to the background, which you can see here. This is actually part of the Parthenon frieze. The Parthenon um, in originally, well, the Parthenon is still in, in Athens, but the friezes have been removed and they are in the Brit one of the British museums. Here you have less restrictions in engineering than you have in full round because, again, they are physically attached to the background surface. They are considered three-dimensional, but they maintain some two-dimensional qualities. You have different types. You have what's called lower relief or base relief, which only project a small distance from the background, which you can see here in the Egyptian work. 
and we have what's called high relief or hot relief. And these are projected at least half their depth. And this is at the top, this is in the pediment of the New York Stock Exchange. When you look at this, these figures almost seem to be freestanding figures, but they're not. They're actually still relief sculptures. They're attached to that background. And then finally, we have what's called linear. Some people disagree with Spore, the author of your book, if whether this is actually another form. Why? Because with the linear works, most of the time you can argue that they are also three-dimensional. However, usually linear works are made using two-dimensional objects, and what's emphasized in their construction are linear items. And you can clearly see that in the work here. And then in the work here, this is actually from um, the waterfront in Columbus, Ohio. So while they occupy three-dimensional space and they look three-dimensional, these works are considered linear. However, for our purposes, if you said it was linear and full round, I would be absolutely fine with that. All right, next thing we look at when we look at a sculpture, so first decide if it's full round, linear, or relief. Then you want to look at the method of execution, which simply, simply means how it was made. There are four main categories of execution for sculpture. We have subtraction, construction, substitution, and manipulation. Subtraction, or carved work, is the first one. And what happens is this, is we start with some larger substance and the artist uh, removes the unwanted material. So they, subtracts it, they subtract it from the original block, if you will. Here we have Michelangelo's David, 1501 to 1504. It's made of marble. Michelangelo claimed that what he did was that the form was always in the block, then he just released it by subtracting what shouldn't be there. You can also see it in work such as this. This is You the Great Taming the Waters, and it's made from jade. Within this work, again, it's full round. You can make arguments that part of it is relief, but it is made through the, the execution of subtraction. What was not wanted is moved away. Historically, sculptures have worked with whatever materials have been available to them. Stone has been the most popular. Why? Because it's harder and it's longer lasting. Your book goes into different types of rock that are used and the different, um, whether they're good or not. Uh, probably the most popular is the metamorphic. Why? This is usually marble. It lasts a long time. It's very durable, yet it carves easily. And marble also exists in a broad, a broad range of colors. But you can see a work here. This is actually a method of execution that's still subtraction, but this is made from a larger piece of wood. This is Madeline, Pet, Petulant Madeline, and that is uh, Mary Magdalene, and it was created by Donatello, 1453 to 55, and again, it's made of wood. The next method of execution is construction, and it's exactly what it sounds like. Here, we start with some small amount of raw materials, and we add elements together. Here you can see, you should all be familiar with this, this is the Statue of Liberty by Frederick Auguste Bartholdi. Um, it was dedicated in 1886. This was made up of many smaller pieces and then put together. You can also see it in this work, Puppy by Jeff Koons. This work was constructed, it's stainless steel soil, geotextile fabrics, um, it has an inter internal irrigation system, and then live flowering plants. Kind of think of this as a giant chia pet. When this was first constructed, none of the flowers had bloomed yet, yet they were planted onto the surface, and then over time, they developed into this. So you have a material um, that's a living material that is part of it. And again, this is the, con the construction method. Next, we have substitution, or this is also known as casting or replacement, because what happens in this, we always involves a mold, and you're going to have a substance that comes in and substitutes in the space. The most popular form of this are bronzes. So what happens in this, you have the process is you create an identically sized model of the intended sculpture, and then 
You cover this with a positive um, material, usually some sort of plaster, sometimes it's sand. When this is hardened and removed, it retains the st still retains the surface configuration. This then is be a negative, and that becomes the mold. Material is then poured inside the mold. When it's hard and removed, you have the piece. It's then polished if need be. Bronzes are probably the most obvious example of this. Here you have the Augustus Rodin's Thinker, 1902. This is a bronze. This is actually the one located in front of Grawmeyer Hall on the campus of the University of Louisville. This was created through the lost wax technique. This is not the original thinker, um, but it was the first one that was made from the mold after the original, and this was the only one using the lost wax technique. Your book talks about the lost wax technique. It's hard to understand it reading it or just listening to me talk about it. So here there's a short YouTube clip that actually shows you that process. And then here's just another work made from substitution. This is made with fiberglass and acrylic. So you can see here bronze is not the only, um, only material that's used, even though it is the most popular. And then finally, our last method of execution is what's called manipulation, also known as modeling. What happens in this? You have pliable materials, and they're shaped by either the artist's hands or a tools. Think of the image we have here. We have the potter's wheel, we have the clay. And so this, it's a softer substance, something that can be manipulated and formed into another shape. Here's another example of this. This is one that has been already put in a kiln because usually you have to do something. Um, so when you have clay, to pottery, whatever, you need to make it set. Lots of times it is cooked, cooked in a kiln. This is Robert Arnson's Case of Bottles, 1964. You can see here it looks old and weathered and cracked, and that was done very intentionally. Um, he actually put this in the kiln for a long time because he wanted to have this older, broken, used look to it. Well, next, let's talk about some compositions, our elements and principles of composition within sculpture. These same elements as we've discussed before, you can use them the same way as we have in two-dimensional art. Main difference is mass. Remember, unlike in two-dimensional works where usually mass is implied, in sculpture, mass is physical. It physically takes up space because it is three-dimensional. It has actual volume and density. Now, within mass, though, it can still be implied, and you can see that in the work here. This is Psyche Revived by Cupid's Kiss, Antonio Canova, 1777, and it is also made of marble. Here you can see it's one piece of marble, yet we can see implied mass in it. When you look at Cupid's wings, they seem lighter. Why? How they're created. They're up towards the top and they're pointing straight out. Um, Psyche, you can tell that her form seems heavier. He's actually just kind of picked her up from the ground. She was limp. And then look on the rock that they're laying on. There's also a piece of cloth. And you can see within this that the cloth seems, if I asked you what was lighter, the rock or the cloth, you would probably say the cloth. However, this is all made from the same piece of granite, and so it's all implied mass within the work. So within a three-dimensional work, you will have physical mass, but you will also can still have implied mass. Okay. Um, and sculpture line is shown in, in terms of the form. Again, an open form directs your eye through the piece um, and throughout the piece, then outside of the space. Close directs the eye back into the form. This is an example of close because you have the lines of the wings drawing you straight in. And then probably the main focal point is Psyche's arms framing Cupid's face in the moment right before they kiss, creating that focal area right in the center. Again, color is important in some works, in the, um, but in this one, obviously we don't really have color. This was a marble that was not painted. Texture, we can have actual texture, or it can be perceived, again, through, um, through different tools. 
Then some principles of composition, proportion is one we can talk about. Here we are looking at Michelangelo's Pieta, 1498 to 99, and it's made of marble. And it's in St. Peter's uh, Basilica in the Vatican. Here with proportion, remember proportion is the relationship of shapes, um, parts to each other. So what happens here, what we're looking at in the Pieta is this is the moment that Christ has come down from the cross, from the crucifixion. So we have Mary holding the dead, the, the, the body of, of Jesus. Within this work, if you look at the proportion, if Mary stood up, she would be huge. That in reality, the figure of Jesus was probably much bigger than Mary. He's usually portrayed that way. But in this work, he seems much smaller, and she is actually the dominant figure of the work. This actually was very controversial at the time because people were upset that she was the central image of the work and felt like it should have been Jesus, but it's a very, very powerful moment. And again, this is created through the proportion. Think how the work would be different if Jesus was very big and Mary would be very little. It would completely change the work. Again, we can talk about repetition, repetition made up of rhythm, harmony, variation, and you can see that in the work. Look at the folds in her dress, we, her dress or her robe, whatever you want to call it. We have repetition within there, different patterns, which helps you to understand the work more. You can talk about in a work if components are consonant or dissonant, whether they seem to go together or not. And then some other factors the book goes through. Um, Atriculation, how we move from one element to another in a work. Focal area, we've already talked about this in Psyche Revived by Cupid's Kiss and some of the other works. Now this can be more complex than in two-dimensional art because in many cases, especially when we have full round sculptures, you can see the work from different angles. So there are different points of view. So what may be one a focal area from one vantage point may not be the intended focal area from another vantage point. Um, other things, ephemeral and environmental sculptures, what happens with these? These are, the idea behind this is that art is an activity of change, that things in, naturally change. They don't always stay the same. And environmental and ephemeral art sculpture takes this in mind. These are works that are designed to change over time. And here what you can see, this is Spiral Jetty by Robert Smithson. Smithson excuse me. It's in the Great Salt Lake in Utah. It was created in 1969 to 1970, and it's made up of earth, rocks, dirt. And what he did is, you can see from the picture on the top left, is it's this large spiral. You can actually go out and walk on this. However, at certain times of the year, because of flooding, it's almost completely underwater, and at times it's completely underwater, so you can't see this. Eventually, because of the natural elements, this work will eventually disappear. It will literally weather away. Yet, that was part of the intention of this work, that it should be changing and eventually should disappear. Why? That's how things in life are. Another thing your book mentions is what's called found art or found sculptures. These are also called object, objects to art. And these are objects created in nature that are considered art. Probably the most common one we can think of are driftwood sculptures. This is where somebody has just gone out and they find a piece of driftwood and they consider it beautiful. You're not supposed to. Found art should not be changed in any way. If you change it, it's no longer simply found. Now, you will see many artworks that are created with found objects, where somebody goes out, finds random stuff. Think about going dumpster diving and finding random pieces and then creating something new from it. Now, the something new, in our case, we'll say a sculpture, that is not found art. That's been created, yet it was made of found objects. Some other things to think about when we talk about sculpture is lighting and environment. Many of the works that we see, especially ones in museums, 
are in places that they were never intended to be or that the artists would never have thought they were going to be. Think about Michelangelo's David. We already talked about this. This was actually designed and constructed to be on top of the dome of the Florence Cathedral. However, when the powers that be saw it, said no, it was too beautiful that we don't want it that far away. We want it closer so people could see it. So it was put in the uh, Plaza Vecchio in Florence. It's now also been moved. It's no longer out in the, the plaza, which is a courtyard, if you will. Um, but it's actually inside the building, the academia there. So it was never intended to be seen in that manner. Now, we do have some work, some sculptures that were intended. Lighting and environment are very important to them. And what you see here is a great example of this. This is actually the Vietnam Veterans Memorial created by Maya Lin. It opened in 1982. It's made of black granite, and it's 493 and a half feet long. With this one, the environment and the lighting are very much a part of it. It was part of Lynn's design. For those of you who have gone and seen this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The marble, the, I'm sorry, the granite slabs with the names in it are highly, highly polished. Why? So the viewer, as you're looking at it, you actually see yourself reflected in the work. And you can see that here. If you look in the back, the left background, you can see people standing on the left, and we can clearly see their reflection in the wall. That was part of the design. Why? Lynn wanted people, as they were standing in front of the wall, to actually see themselves with the names, physically making them part of the memorial. Also, the environment's very important. The entire work is a large open V. One part of it points towards the Washington Memorial, the other part points to the Lincoln Memorial on the National Mall. Also, as you start to walk into this, it's only about half a foot tall. And then as you continue walking, it goes to about nine feet. And you actually walk down in and then you come back out. Also part of the plan. The idea with this was it was as you were walking into the Vietnam War and then you were physically coming back out of the war. So with this, the lighting and the environment are very, very important key elements to the work. There are smaller traveling Vietnam veteran memorials, the walls that go around. However, they don't have the same environmental impact to them. Well, that's the end of our lecture on sculpture. Again, this is just meant to supplement the information in your book. If you have any questions, please let me know.